Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the SDI Group PLC AGM and Investor Q&A. Throughout this session, investors will be on listening only mode. Questions are encouraged and can be submitted at any time by the Q&A tab situated on the right hand corner of your screen. Simply type in your text in the box beneath and press send. The company may not be in a position to answer every question it receives during the presentation itself. However, the company will review all questions submitted today and publish responses where it's appropriate to do so. These will be available via your Investor Meet company dashboard. I'd also like to remind you that this presentation is being recorded. Before we begin, I would like to submit the following poll. I'd now like to hand over to Ken Ford, Chairman of SDI Group. Good morning, Ken. Good morning. Good, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the AGM of the SDI Group PLC. Um, and the kickoff time is 11 o'clock. A quorum of members is present, and I therefore declare the meeting open. Uh, under the exceptional circumstances of the COVID-19 pandemic, we are rather reluctantly holding the AGM as a closed meeting, although all the directors are here in person. However, in order to allow shareholders and other potential shareholders a chance to put questions and indeed to voice opinions, the formal AGM will be followed by a Q&A session and those present are able, as described, to submit questions under Ask a Question function on their screens. All res resolutions will be voted by means of a poll using the proxy votes received prior to the meeting rather than a show of hands so that the votes of all shareholders are counted in accordance to the number of shares held and all votes tendered are taken into account. Polls will be taken immediately as the resolutions are proposed. I'm joined here today in Cambridge by Mike Creeden, the Chief Executive, John Abel, the Chief Financial Officer, Isabel Knapper, non-executive director, and David Tilston, also a non-executive together. And together, we will form the necessary quorum for the AGM. You should have all received the annual report and accounts with the notice convened of this annual general meeting. If there are no objections, uh, I will take the notice as read. As there are no objections, the notice is taken as read. I will now proceed to the formal part of the meeting. We have 10 resolutions to be put to members, eight of which are ordinary resolutions, and two are special resolutions. I propose that the report of the directors and the audited accounts of the independent audited report for the year end of 30th of April 2020 be received and approved by members. I put the resolution to the meeting by way of a poll to be held immediately. The result of that poll is 100% of votes in favour, zero against, and I declare the resolution carried by the necessary majority. Secondly, I propose that the auditors, Grant Thornton, be reappointed to act until the conclusion of the next annual general meeting of the company and that the directors be authorised to determine their remuneration for the coming year. I put the resolution to the meeting by way of a poll to be held immediately. The result of the poll is 99.9% .9 in favour, 0.1% against, and I declare the resolution carried by the necessary majority. Thirdly, before the next resolution concerns me, I would like to ask somebody else to propose it. Would you do that, Mike? Yes, I'll propose the resolution. And the result of the poll is I can tell you the result of the poll is 100% in favour, zero against, and I'm delighted to declare the resolution carried by the necessary majority. I propose, fourthly, that Mike Creeden be reappointed as the director of the company, and I put the resolution to the meeting by way of a poll to be held immediately. The result of that poll is 100% of votes in favour, zero votes against and I declare the resolution carried by the necessary majority. Fifth item, I propose that Isabel Napper be reappointed as the director of the company. I put the resolution to the meeting by way of a poll to be held immediately. 
The result of that poll is 94% in favour, 6% against, and I declare the resolution carried by the necessary majority. Sixth item, I propose that David Tilston be reappointed as a director of the company, and I put that resolution to the meeting by way of a poll to be held immediately. The result of that poll is 94% of votes in favour, 6% against, and I declare the resolution carried by the necessary majority. Seventh item, I propose that Jonathan Abel be reappointed as a director of the company. I put the resolution to the meeting by way of a poll to be held immediately. The result of that poll is 100% of votes in favour, zero against, and I declare the resolution carried by the necessary majority. The eighth item is I propose resolution number eight to authorise the directors to allot shares in the company in the notice of an ordinary resolution. I put the resolution to the meeting by way of a poll to be held immediately. The result of that poll is 100% in favour, zero against, and I declare the resolution carried by the necessary majority. The ninth item, I propose to disapply statutory preemption rights in respect of one, rights issues, and two, in respect of shares issued having an aggregate nominal value of up to 48,700 in the notice of a special resolution. And I put the resolution to the meeting by way of a poll to be held immediately. The result of that poll is 99.9% .9 in favour, 0.1% against, and I declare the resolution carried by the necessary <coughs> majority. The tenth item, I propose the resolution to disapply statutory preemption rights in respect of the shares issued with an aggregate nominal value of up to 48,700 in connection with an acquisition of capital or capital investment in the notice as a special resolution. I put the resolution to the meeting by way of a poll to be held immediately. The result of that poll is 99.9 .9 in favour, 0.1% against, and I declare the resolution carried by the necessary majority. That completes the formal business of the meeting. Thank you very much indeed, Ken. Um, ladies and gentlemen, we're shortly going to move moving into the Q&A session. Um, and in order just to ensure that you can see the functionality to submit your questions, on the top of the screen towards the right-hand side, you will see Q&A. If you select the Q&A tab, and then at the bottom, you'll see the ability to type in your text and then press send. That will then send your question directly through to the presenting team. Just while the company take a few minutes to review the questions that have been submitted today, I'd also like to remind you that a recording of this presentation, along with a copy of your slides, and the published Q&A will be accessible via your InvestorMeet company dashboard. Also, post the uh, conclusion of this AGM, investors will be offered the opportunity to provide feedback for the company. Um, we would be very much appreciative if you could then uh, fill in the feedback and give the company your views and expectations. Um, I think that probably addresses it from my point of view. Ken, if I may hand back to you, sir, for the Q&A. Thank you. Yes, before, before, although I've closed the formal business meeting, I'd just like to... Um, mentioned that at uh, 7.30 this morning, the group did uh, make a statement. And that statement says that the group has made a very good start to the, financial, the new financial year. Despite the ongoing economic headwinds, the board is comfortable with current trading and in delivering financials in line with market expectations for the year. So that um, really wraps up, wraps up the meeting from my point of view, and we'll, we'll move on to Q&A. In uh, the first question is, in the final results, you stated that other companies within the group face some uncertainty and a downturn in orders, although all our manufacturing facilities remain in operation. Could you update us on the current position? I'm going to hand over to Mike Creedon, the, the CEO. Okay, it's a sort of very straightforward sort of answer to that. All our business units are, as uh, per the question, but more importantly, all our business units are EBITDA level profitable and also the, none of our business units are on cash burn so uh, there's been no change really right the way through thank you mike 
The second question I've got on the screen is, in the light of a second wave of COVID-19, what contingency plans do you have in terms of those businesses that have already suffered a downturn? Michael. Good question, based on Boris's uh, statement from last night. Uh, we've learned a lot from the April shutdown. All our businesses are and still fully operational. What we've actually started to do is only through ringing around subsidiaries today is uh, with the new rules that we will have staff on a rotor. So we will have a bubble effect within each subsidiary, but people still want to come to work. They don't want to work permanently from home. So we'll do sort of two or three days on, two or three days off with the staff. But uh, more importantly, production will remain as right the way through the shutdown. They will still be fully operational. Thanks, Mike. Um, third question is, I guess you are seeing an increasing pipeline of exciting opportunities. I presume they mean acquisition opportunities. Can you update us in terms of the competitive landscape around new opportunities? Um, I think I can kick off by saying that we have we have no signed deals at the moment, but the, because of because of uh, COVID, slightly less restrictions. Uh, the board is exploring a number of acquisitions, as stated in the annual reports. I don't know if there's anything you want to add, Mike. No, it was just uh, just to reinforce that that uh, Ken and I are actually having meetings now, face to face meetings, which we couldn't do for uh, a number of months. And there are some interesting opportunities out there at the moment. Nothing uh, of uh, where well, we've actually signed a deal or anything. I'd like to move on to the next question. Uh, what are your current thoughts uh, regarding the, the payment of a dividend? Uh, obviously, there are, there are mixed views on this, and the board had some very interesting discussions on that, but I'll ask John to provide our formal position. Well, our position is we, we have not yet decided ever to pay a dividend, but that comes up for review every time, uh, you know, on each, each uh, occasion. I think we are we're kind of philosophically in favor of a dividend but to date we've had plenty of acquisition opportunities and and the shareholder feedback we've had from both retail and and uh, in uh, and institutional investors is that they're happy uh, for no dividend to be paid at the current time of course there are some non-shareholders that might appreciate a dividend and, and uh, you know we bear those in mind as well at some point, I think we will pay dividend because we're a profitable company and all of our, all of our businesses are profitable. So, you know, at some point we will pay a dividend, but for the moment, but, you know, we've not decided to do that. I think, Mark, that uh, uh, wraps up the, the questions on my screen. Now we've got one more come through. If you could scroll up, please. Thank you. Uh, we've answered that question. So we're on... Uh, Right, thank you, I can read it now. Can you talk about your forward visibility and how that compares to earlier this year or perhaps the same stage as last year? Or more generally, outside of this year, how many months is your typical visibility? Very good question, so therefore I'll give it to Mike. Well, we can't really say a lot because we're not allowed to forecast or discuss forecasts in the marketplace. So uh, we've actually very We've got an announcement in the marketplace uh, currently about where we are with uh, brokers forecast. If you look at on the uh, individual companies, we have visibility in a number of companies only a matter of two or three months. And then uh, in a number of other businesses, we've got uh, order books going out sort of six months. So it all depends on what business unit we're looking at. So that's it. Mm -hmm. So it all depends on our business units, what we're looking at, because each one has a different visibility. I think short term or medium. I think one of the benefits of the group is that whilst some may have a short vision, others have a long vision, and while some companies are doing very well, others might be down, but overall we're performing well. So I'm going to move on to the next question. I note today's statement refers to a very good start of the year, whereas last year we said good in last year's statement. Can you give any further detail around this addition? Uh, I don't think I can, other than to say that is correct. Okay. Are you able to say what the market expectations are? Are you comfortable that SDI, SDI is trading in line 
the market expectations set by FinCap, and I think that does show an, a rise in profit for the current year. And obviously, we've said today that we are trading in line with that. I don't know if you've got anything else to add to that, John. No, again, I think that we can't. Re you know, we we carefully made that statement, and that's the statement that's out in the in the marketplace. Mm. So uh, there's not not really anything more we can add. Next question is: Can you comment on the order book, uh, Mike or and or John? Can you tell us how the orders are looking at this moment in time? I think it's. Um... We actually discussed it when we looked at the visibility of each business unit. John can come in as well, and that is a number of vows we have long term visibility on uh, the business units and, and some uh, short term. But, uh, but overall, you know, we've got a solid order book in the group. And uh, quote wise, you know, we've got a strong quotation process in place across the subsidiaries as well, which is coming through. You know, and I think, uh, yeah, and I think, uh, you know, the very good start to this year includes uh, very good order intake. So yes, we're we're very comfortable with, with where we are at the moment. A number of our businesses have, have benefited from the from COVID, which has helped some of the companies. Uh, we've got a next question, which is related: is what headcount changes have been made uh, post furlough? And mm -hmm. uh, Mike, uh, you're up to date with the figures. Yeah, I am. So uh, we had about so we've got about 230 staff in the group, and as we said in the annual report, I think it's about 10% were on furlough. Now we have got, I think, about four or five people on furlough. We've got uh, mainly within apply thermal control, and uh, they're looking to come back in October. So the majority of people are either back. I think we've got two people part time back, but uh, most of the units are really fully operational now. Thank you. And the good question on can you comment on geographic differences? Uh, maybe the US versus the UK and Asia and so on. Are you experiencing any issues also with universities being shut? So first of all, Mike, could you tell us? Um, That's a good some of the... Yeah, it's a good question. Um, what we're actually finding is the US market is very difficult at the moment. You know, there's a big organization called NIH is still not open. So we're finding it difficult to actually uh, sell into there. But more importantly, what we're actually finding is we're commissioning products or selling products over to uh, overseas and we can't commission because we can't get over there. So people want to buy the kit, and we just can't actually get, get on a plane to, to commission the products. So it's very difficult for us. So what we're actually trying to do is to sell or service products within Europe. And then people are very amenable to say it's a waiting game, to say when uh, we can actually get over there and service or commission the products. Really. Thank you, Mike. And now, um, how We've mentioned for Attic that we have a US-based OEM customer and any, have you got any comment on current trading there, please? Uh, Attic is, uh, is actually a star. We said it in the annual report um, and it's one of the areas whereby we have actually gained sales through COVID. And uh, it's a very strong business. We've actually invested in that business. As you've seen in the annual report, we've increased the footprint of the manufacturing process. We've uh, increased uh, the, uh, the sales and marketing function there. And uh, for us, you know, it's still a very, very strong business. Thank you, Mike. Just looking at the next question. Yes, the, the question is really, um, I'll read out the full question. Acquisitions, uh, understanding the science behind the acquisition targets, competitive advantages seems crucial. Which executives have in-depth scientific knowledge or how do you acquire the scientific knowledge to assess new targets and to understand future scientific questions? Um, I think it's a, it's a good question, Mike. Uh, as you well know uh, from my CV, I'm an accountant. So uh, we uh, we use uh, or we uh, through the DD process, we use historical information. So a lot of our businesses that have been around for 15 to 20 years, and also we have to try to get behind the management uh, of those businesses to see uh, whether they can still actually gain organic growth. But recently, we've attracted some really s smart people within the business. A good example is Peter Astles who's an engineer, engineer by training, and he's actually been working alongside us in the acquisition process. 
a good example is when we uh, actually acquired Shell Instruments. He was working on, alongside us on uh, the uh, technical side. And also uh, Steve Chambers, who's the CEO of Attic, he helps us out now. So we have got resources now to look at the technical side of acquisitions. Yeah, and I, I would like to add, I've had a, a lifetime of analyzing companies in the city and I think I've, I can smell the bad ones. Um, and hopefully we've been choosing the good ones with, uh, as you say, technical help. Uh, let us situation, please, on Pro Reveal. Um, would it not be worthwhile aligning to a larger diagnostics help company to leverage, please? What's the Pro Reveal situation, please, Mike? That's what we tried from the outset, was actually to align it with something like Getting or, or Steris. But they've actually got their own sort of testing out there, even though it doesn't align with uh, the standards. And uh, it's a difficult process. As we know at the moment, COVID is around. People haven't got the money. And uh, for us, it's a great product. But what we've actually done, we've said it before, is uh, we've reduced the, uh, the resources on that product now. And we just use one sole distributor within the UK who's actually trying to uh, sell that uh, product. We still sell it in small quantities, but not in the quantities where we first thought of probably three or four years ago. Thanks, Mike. And ne next question is a follow on from the dividend question. Uh, the full question is, I would have a question, which actually a follow on of the one asked about dividends for the future, maybe when cash inflow will be larger than acquisition prospects, have the board considered share buybacks instead of a dividend to offset options or previous offerings. We have discussed share buybacks and dividends, but at the moment it's the board's view that there are a number mm. of potential acquisitions uh, for potential perhaps to double the size of the company at least. So we're not uh, doing either of those at the moment, but we keep everything under review and these matters are discussed. Anything, anything to add? No. No, I think it's fine. Next question. Of the markets you serve, please, can you comment on the ones which are doing well and the ones that are struggling? It's a very difficult question because we have a huge number of products in a huge number of markets. Uh, but have you got any overview, Mike or John, please start? Oh, with I, th I think it's, uh, you, you just look at the press, really. So uh, the ones which we're finding it difficult are aerospace. One of our biggest customers is Rolls-Royce. As you well know, they've made 9,000 people redundant, so we're finding it difficult in the short term, but Rolls-Royce are still saying they're going to come back and want some uh, products developed. So that's the major area at the moment. Another area is on the chillers. Uh, we make chillers for the industrial sector. Industrial plants are still up, not opening up. So that's another difficult area for us. And the uh, final area is universities. You know, they're actually opening up now, but we don't know how much research is going to be undertaken across the world at the moment within those. But uh, so therefore, that has an impact on a number of our other businesses. So that's the major areas really for us. They're the areas of weakness, but medical and others are doing yeah, well. Yeah, they're doing very well. well. And the next question um, was very similar to that on the end segments on the long term, long term stress. Um, probably not. No. 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 Can you comment on the level of debt and cash in view of the drawdown of borrowings as an initial reaction to COVID? And I will ask John to update us on, uh, well, we have said that we're cash generative, but I'll hand over to John. Yeah. So right at the beginning in March, we took steps to, to increase the amount of cash we had on hand and, and we drew down uh, on our borrowing. It turned out pretty quickly that uh, we remain cash generative. And in fact, even at a faster rate than we had pre uh, shutdown or lockdown. And part of the reason for that was the, 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 some of the areas where we were supplying into COVID related sales, uh, we were able to get cash down payments for some of those sales. So actually cash has been remarkably good um, uh, for the, the end of last year and, and continues to be good uh, into this year. So um, I think we were right to be cautious right at the beginning of the uh, the process. We're starting now to pay back down. Um, in fact, we have started to pay back down some of the debt, uh, the additional debt we took out. And so cash is at a very comfortable situation at the moment. Uh, the next question was on the non-execs 
uh, had 94% support, and I, I will answer this question because when they very first joined the board, there is there is a difference of opinion between different nomads as to whether uh, options can be given to non-execs. There was a very small allocation given on their coming onto the board. There would be no further uh, allocations of shares, so there's no further um, allocations thought for the non-execs. So we're very comfortable with what, what we did. A lot of the poll companies who advise uh, investors are US-based, um, so it is a matter of opinion. But the, the contribution, I'm sure, from the executives will okay. all agree with me that the contribution of the non-execs has been absolutely fantastic, and we have a very strong board. So I yeah. have no problem with that small allocation made on their inception on the board. The next question is what CapEx is planned for this year? Uh, we have obviously we've got budgets and I'll hand over to John. Yeah, so SDI Group is, is generally a low CapEx business. So uh, capital ex expenditure uh, is typically around well, less than 2% of our sales each year. And this year will probably be a low year for capital expenditure. In the last couple of years, we've spent quite a bit of money on lease refurb, lease buildings refurbishment, but that, that program is, is just about finished. So, so this year, we're not rushing into any major capital investments. And so it's going to be on the rather low side, I think. Um, there's another question on Pro Reveal, but it's more about. Um... Has COVID affected? Can you? Uh, I could answer that. Yeah, not yeah. at all. Because what Proville does is look at dirty surgical instruments. Uh, and this is not related. Where we, we did have uh, a good uh, month or three months was with a ventilator project with MPB, which we actually did mention in the annual report. But uh, like I said, Proville is not related to COVID at all. The next question is looking backwards, which acquisition has been the biggest outperformer versus initial expectations? I'll ask Mike to. It, the fact is that a number of them have, have all actually performed quite well, but I'll ask Mike, are there any particular styles you want to talk about? I think about? there's any, well, the one which comes to mind is before you, Ken, and, and uh, myself joined, and that is Attic Cameras. Absolutely. Yeah, that was a, a very small business turning over probably a million, making a hundred thousand pounds, and uh, it's gone from strength to strength. That business, it really has. That's the star, and you can actually see it. You know, for the last two or three years within the annual pool. So the star is the one that Mike and I and the other executives and non-executives were not involved in. <laughs> <laughs> and the next question is: What percent of the SDI shares are collectively owned by the board? I think. It's in the order of uh, one to one point five percent, I think. Um, yeah, I think you'd have to look at the annual report to provide some numbers. Yeah. You can find them there, um, but it, it's not huge, but it's growing. Yeah. Yeah. So Thank you. The fact is, we joined the board. We, uh, Mike and I, joined the board uh, at a, at a time we didn't own the the stock, so we were um, joining the company and bought shares in our own name, which is. You know, looking at the next question, that, that's I think I think, um, I think uh, that is the last the last question. I just like uh, to wrap up. Yes, Mark, have you got? Yeah, questions? no, sorry, I was just going to say I think you have uh, addressed. Um, and of course, if any questions come in afterwards, we'll obviously make those available to you. And um, I was just going to suggest perhaps now, if um, if you wouldn't mind, I guess wrapping up, and then I can divert investors to provide the company uh, with their views and expectations through the feedback. Well, I just wrap up by saying this wasn't our chosen route. We actually welcome AGMs and we enjoy talking to a number of investors that come along and that is the best situation. But in the circumstances, thank you, Mark, for providing the platform. Thank you for the board for turning up here today despite COVID. And thank you, investors, for, for your support. Perfect. Ken, Mike, John, thank you very much for uh, updating investors today. I think particularly given the, uh, the the barriers that COVID-19 has presented to AGM, so thank you once again. Um, could I please ask investors not to close this session as you'll be automatically redirected for the opportunity to provide feedback. If you access this meeting via our website, the feedback page will appear. Um, if you accessed it via the link in the email, you'll be asked just simply to log in and submit your feedback. 
we'd be very grateful if you could provide that to the company. So on behalf of the management team of SDI, we'd like to thank you for attending today's AGM presentation. That now concludes today's session. Good morning.